Hello yet again, and welcome to our third and final panel and final program uh, of this annual, uh, first annual St. Snake Patrick's Day uh, live stream programming lineup. You can tell it's been a long day, but I could not be more excited for the punctuation mark that we are about to put on this series of live streams, because today we are welcoming, uh, tonight actually, no matter where you are, we are welcoming a trio of really, really, really amazing women, all of whom have incredibly fascinating, or people, sorry, all of whom have incredibly fascinating research and um, could not be more excited to bring those folks to you today. So let's do some quick introductions and bring everybody on screen. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so we are welcoming tonight the American Museum of Natural History's Dr. Ariana Kuhn. First public appearance as a doctor, is that right? Yes, that is right. Ooh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, you're allowed to be as loopy as you want, having done that <laughs> yesterday. Um, so, uh, and your research focuses on how essentially new species originate and resist extinction in Madagascar, a threatened mm -hmm. biodiversity hotspot. Uh, next up, we have the University of California Riverside's Jess Tingle, a biologist interested in evolution, biomechanics, and all things limbless, with a special focus on sidewinders. <laughs> Very excited to have you. Hi, Jess. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, next up, our STEM Outreach Coordinator for the Atlas Institute at the University of California Boulder, Dr. Shaz Amor. Hey, Shaz. Hey. Thanks for being here. Uh, your work focuses on creating accessible science outreach and education and exploring and describing the unique sensations and neural processing of animals, such as flying snakes <laughs> <laughs> and mosquitoes and other amazing things. But yes, flying snakes tonight. <laughs> Um, so thank you again for being here and for viewers, the way we're going to do this, if you haven't caught our other panels, is uh, a series of 15 minute flash science talks from everybody here. And if you have questions for our panelists, just drop them in the comment section of Facebook or the chat box of YouTube anytime at all. We will loop back at the end and ask as many of them as we can. Um, and so with that, we will kick it off with our first speaker, Ariana. So we'll see the other two in just a moment. And we're going to give you your slides and take it away, thank you. Awesome, so, um, sorry, one moment. Okay, so I um, wanted to just also introduce myself again to mention, yes, I'm at the Museum of Natural History, like Laurel said, um, and I am there just completing my PhD working on snakes. Now, I love all reptiles, which is why I made sure that I included some crocodilian skulls in this in this talk, but I especially love snakes. I love catching them and I love learning every possible thing about them. Now, I didn't always start out studying snakes, um, like maybe many members of the audience. I always just really liked animals. I was an animal kid, all kinds of animals. So when I grew up, I knew that I wanted to do some kind of job that in included these animals. And I didn't really know what kinds of jobs were out there for people who liked animals. I thought, well, my options are maybe Shamu trainer, or a vet, but I was a terrible swimmer. Um, and I didn't really wanna work with animals that were sick. I wanted to do stuff with them in their natural environments. Um, when I got to high school, I was very sure based on some of the classes I took that I did not want to be a medical doctor with people. Um, but I really liked my comparative anatomy class where we were doing cat dissections. And I really liked a genetics course that I took um, when we were working with Drosophila. And when I, by the time I got to college, I knew that I wanted to do research. I wanted to ask my own questions and find really cool solutions to solving and answering them. So I got involved in a lab working with geckos, trying to understand how their toe pads help them adapt to different environments um, and involve in deserts in sub-Saharan Africa. And this made me fall in love with research because I started getting to do field work and help describe new species. Um, at this period of time, I kind of had this expectation before college that all research scientists wore lab coats and gloves and goggles and just poured solutions back and forth into little tiny tubes. And some scientists do this and they do really cool research. But what I found working um, in herpetology, working with these geckos, is that a lot of scientists aren't like this. And they actually are just like me and they love animals and they love studying them in their natural environments. And they also all ended up being my best friends in the entire world. And sometimes we do wear lab coats, but mostly it's just for photos. Um, and so moving on from there, um, from this kid that just really liked animals and wanted to spend time around them, um, I got to where I am today, which is doing field-based research um, with museum collections and in the field to understand how species originate and 
um, you know, why the patterns of biodiversity that we see in our world today even originated. And um, this means that when I go out into different environments, for example, right in Inwood Hill Park, which is in Manhattan, where I live right now, I can actually find milk snakes. Um, so this is a really rare and cool species to see somewhere in a city like Manhattan. And the question I've always been interested in is why is this species here and not in other places? Why can I find rat snakes in Pennsylvania, but not other species? Um, and to answer this question, uh, you can work in somewhere like North America, and that's fantastic. But for me, I wanted to work somewhere that was so incredibly full of rich biodiversity that was endemic, meaning it's not found anywhere else on Earth. So that's how I ended up working in Madagascar for my PhD. So this is off the um, east coast of Africa, just across the Mozambique Channel. We have this island, which is about the size of California. So a pretty large island, which is sometimes referred to um, as the next largest continent because it's just so enormous and so diverse. And on this island are some of the craziest species you can imagine in the entire universe. So some of you guys might know some of the primates on the island, the lemurs, but there's also a ton of snakes and frogs and really cool insects and uh, chameleons and so forth. And all of these animals are, for the most part, not found anywhere else on Earth, meaning that things are so endemic to this island. So what I wanted to know for part of my PhD studies was how does one single island produce so many different species? What are the properties of this place that make it so unique that we find things that we don't find anywhere else on Earth? Now, some of you might be familiar with the lemurs of the island of Madagascar. These are really cool primates. They're entirely endemic. They're found nowhere else on Earth. And we've been doing a lot of research on them in the past. Um, but what you might not be aware of is that there's also a lot of reptile diversity on the island. So, for example, uh, the world's smallest chameleons are here. The world's largest and most colorful chameleons are here. And there's also a lot of snakes. There is more than 100 species of snakes on the island, um, the predominant group being known as the gem snakes. And these are not your average snakes. These snakes essentially colonize the island and diversify to fill every possible ecological niche space there. So giant red-eyed snakes that spend time looking for you know, geckos in the trees at night, snakes that are the most sexually dimorphic of all snakes on planet Earth, known as langaha or the leaf nose snakes with these little leaf nose projections on the front of their faces and the males and females look completely different and we don't even know why they have this leaf appendage on their nose. That's how little we know about some of these organisms. Um, really tiny snakes, it's like this heteroliodon that kind of burrow under the ground. I actually found this species in the field when I tripped over a log in the forest at night and my face kind of landed right next to it. So I got really lucky and it ended up being a new species. Um, there's giant hognose snakes. They have these upturned noses and they will dig eggs from different oplurid lizards and chameleons from the ground and then eat them. And they look kind of like the hognose snakes that we have here in the United States, but they're entirely unrelated. This is convergent evolution. Um, there are bright golden snakes. This is Madagascarophus coleobrinus or the Malagasy cat-eyed snake. This snake is actually really polymorphic, meaning that there's a ton of different color patterns found in the species. They can be, you know, jet black to golden to silver colored. And these color patterns actually have nothing to do with being different species. They're just naturally uh, variant in their environments. Um, there's things like this Lycodryas citrinus that are literally bumblebee snakes. They're really, really thin and you can find them in the trees at night crawling around. Um, some snakes do things like climb up in the trees like this Compsophis and they actually eat the goo surrounding frog eggs. So their diets are really different. Their dentition is all really different. Um, their morphologies are super different. There's purple snakes like this Ithisiphus that are actually arboreal and sometimes they can even be found hanging out in caves waiting to catch bats. Um, and in the end, you know, all this bulk of this diversity is the result of a single colonization of the island when one species got here about 30 million years ago and kind of diversified across this landscape. So studying these different species groups, um, like the hognose snake and catching them in the field, I was able to get genetic samples for all of them, study these genetic samples back in the lab um, and produce uh, <laughs> catching some that actually, you know, Sometimes when you try to take a selfie with a snake, they don't like it. And this is kind of the end result. Um, but the end result of this study was sampling all these snakes and going to Madagascar a ton of times and doing all this field work was that we were able to build an evolutionary tree of how all these snakes are related. And using this tree, we not only were able to identify a ton of new species, so we identified 30 new potential lineages, um, just to show you on this graph here. 
Everything in pink is kind of a distribution of all previously described species and when, when they originated, and then all those new species that we found. We also knew that they colonized the island from this study about 30 million years ago, and that all the different ecoregions of Madagascar contributed to producing this enormous diversity. So a really underestimated um, group on the island. That's a really important, important vertebrate lineage. Um, this is my colleague Skip <laughs> holding one of the snakes who I studied and you guys may have heard his talk earlier today. And one of the other findings from this study that is that I focused on a couple of these new lineages that we found and I'm currently working on using their morphology and their genetics and their ecology to understand um, what are the traits that really make them different and use this to describe these new species to science. So the species pictured here on this page are cryptic lineages, meaning they look just like species that are already described. They're very common, we see them all the time, and yet they're actually genetically very, very different. So the crypsis is that we can't see the differences, we have to look at their genomes. So I'm currently working on the whole snake genomes to describe these, these important differences because we can only protect species if we know they exist. So all these studies where we go and we document and describe the biodiversity in Madagascar are contributing to this body of knowledge of just how many species there are and where the bulk of these species are distributed so that we can help assign conservation priorities to localities that have really rare genetic species or genetic populations. So all the way from my early work on my field, first field season on the left to where I am today, this is kind of how I got into herpetology and how I ended up studying snakes on Madagascar. I also wanted to know if certain habitat, habitats or certain species traits are what's important for generating this diversity. So what can we learn about snakes um, and other reptiles that will tell us about everything on Madagascar? And so one thing people might not know about Madagascar is there's a ton of different types of habitats and landscape features on the island. There's the high central plateau, which is a mosaic of kind of grassland, savanna, and dry deciduous forest pockets where you might find something like this burkesia, this micro chameleon. Um, there's these singy uh, formations, which are karst limestone formations with that also contain pockets of dry deciduous forest where you might find a paradurotan jaca that has this really specialized toe pads for clinging to these singy walls. Um, and there's a bunch of other habitats here as well. There's the high and uh, lowland coastal rainforest that you guys might be familiar with. There are these specialized dry deciduous forests that become so dry um, in, the, in uh, the dry season that you would never think they could rehydrate. There's the endemic spiny desert where this opleurid is from. And I wanted to know if these different ecoregions um, each had different properties that made more species be generated than the other ones. I also wanted to know how elevation came into play. So some species like Madagascarophus lolo, this gray snake up in the corner that my colleagues just um, described is only found from Ankarana. So we only know it's on this kind of high elevation uh, plateau. Things like Burkesia tuberculata that are from Amber Mountain are only found on this mountain. Things like Scaphiophryne, this rainbow frog in the bottom left hand corner are only found in Asalo. Whereas other species like this heterixalix frog are found on some of the massifs on the island, but also found in lowland areas. So they can be found everywhere. So is there something special about species that can only be behind, found in high elevation areas versus species that can be found everywhere that contribute to diversity? I also wanted to know about species traits. So I made a lot of comparisons um, in species and how they respond to their environments um, in the past between things like two geckos that both are nocturnal, but one, Paradera picta on the left, is terrestrial. This is actually a juvenile, and that's why his little tail is orange, and then this will be this coloration will be lost as he becomes an adult. It's a defense mechanism. Here are Platus avenali on the right. This is a leaf-tailed gecko. They're super cryptic, and they're arboreal. So they have this kind of leaf-like pattern that lets them hide in the trees. So I wanted to know if species traits have caused them to respond differently uh, to changes in their environment in the past. I also wanted to know about differences, be major differences between taxonomic groups on the island. So things like geckos versus things like amphibians that I expect to kind of be very different because of some special traits that amphibians have that aren't gonna be shared by reptiles. So in the end, I wanted to know if species had responded to climate change that happened over the last like 500,000 years when things were getting cold in Madagascar and then they would get warm and wet. So these fluctuations actually happened a lot and how species responded to these in the past will let us know how species might respond to these things in the future and let us know what are important things about Madagascar that we need to conserve right now. So I did this with uh, trait comparisons and ecoregion comparisons. And what I found was that looking across all these reptiles, so snakes, geckos, chameleons, um, tons of different frogs on the island was that 
everything seemed to be doing something different. So it, there was no group of species of reptile and amphibian that was doing something um, where they were all responding in the same way to the same thing. However, when I focused on species, whether they were reptiles or amphibians that were just found in the Eastern humid rainforests of Madagascar, I found that all these species had recently um, expanded their populations um, historically when climate was changing. So this is a good thing. When there's a lot of good habitat that an organism likes, they can expand their range um, and this promotes genetic diversity being maintained over time. So these species were thriving in the Eastern rainforest. And this was really important because one thing that we know is that when human beings arrive on a continent, we often will see a loss of large mammal diversity. So in this graph here, you can see that the red line is when humans arrived in Australia, North America, and Madagascar. And shortly afterwards, the diversity of large mammal species drops. There's a ton of extinction. Now we know on Madagascar, about 1000 years ago, we lost a ton of megafauna. So we lost things like these giant elephant birds. That's one of their eggs compared to a chicken egg. We lost giant tortoises. We lost giant lemurs the size of gorillas. And one thing that uh, my research highlights is that one, um, we know that the reason these species went extinct wasn't just because of humans. It turns out that they had been responding to climate change in the past and they had not been doing well. So they had been having bottlenecks and reductions in population size. And this coupled with human arrival is really the smoking gun that kind of ended these lineages. And so now we know for Madagascar, that it's going to be incredibly important to understand things like how important the eastern rainforest was to my different species, um, whether it's for reptiles that are snakes or reptiles that are like chameleons, like this little brookesia. And we can use this kind of stuff, like what I found here from Madagascar, and extrapolate it to all the other species on the island, like the endemic lemurs. And likewise, when we study things about lemurs, we can leverage information that we learn from these systems and apply it to snakes and reptiles and promote conservation and kind of conserve these lineages as we lose a massive amount of forested areas in this habitat. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude my talk. So I'm really grateful that you guys were listening and I hope that you enjoyed the pictures from my field seasons in Madagascar. It was really fun for me to look at them again. That was awesome. I know I could see all of the other panelists, um, and my co-host Christina backstage and we were all just like this the whole time. That was amazing. I'm so glad you um, yeah. And also, I mean, amazing that you fell on a new species. That seems super efficient. Yeah, I actually have that new species. I brought it up here on my desk. So you can see just how little it is. I keep it in a jar at the museum. So this is Heteroleodon spa. And I was so happy that I tripped on that particular tree stump and found it. <laughs> it's incredible. And also we, your um, selfie photo with that was like slightly bloodied made me think of something that Christina and I found surprising about all of today's snake panelists, which is that you all have a um, predilection to hold snakes really close to your face for photos, which is was just surprising as like a <laughs> snake holding person. Um, thank you so much. That was so yeah, cool. We have great question. questions for you. Um, awesome. We'll say goodbye to you for the moment and welcome okay, Jess. We'll see you in a sec. And Jess, hi again. Thank you so Hello. much. Yeah, can't wait to hear your talk. We're gonna throw up those slides now and I'll get out of here and see you in a moment. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so thanks for coming everybody. Today I'm really excited to talk to you about some of my work on the biomechanics and evolution of sidewinding locomotion in snakes. Uh, before I get into the research, I'll first answer the question, why am I studying biomechanics and evolution? So like Ariana, as a little kid, I was really into animals. And in my case, it was really these like creepy crawlies that just spoke to me. So things like the millipedes or the tadpoles or the bats, uh, all these creatures that have kind of unusual body plans. You know, they're not two-legged like us or four-legged like our dog, and they have to move in all of these different ways. So I was really excited about all of these creatures. And of course, the whole point of evolution is to understand why are there so many kinds of animals? Uh, this is an actual title of an actual paper that was really influential. Um, in the late 50s. So why are there so many kinds of animals? How do we get this diversity? And so you might think that that would have led me to biology, but again, like Ariana, I didn't really know what careers were out there. I thought if you studied biology in college, you were gonna have to be a medical doctor or a veterinarian, which had zero appeal whatsoever to me. On the other hand, uh, I discovered that 
I really, really liked physics and math in high school. And as far as I knew, engineering was the career that you pursue if you like physics and math. And so I went to college as an engineering student, not no, really knowing what engineers do, but thinking that was maybe my thing. Um, and luckily, at the end of that first year of engineering, I took a herpetology class. And the professor was actually on a panel earlier. So Harry Green was the professor and came up to me after class one day and said, hello, young lady, did you ever think about being a herpetologist? And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, but I thought that was only like Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin. And so Harry sort of told me about how you can have a career in research. And he lent me a copy of this book called Biomechanics. And biomechanics turned out to be perfect because what biomechanics is, is just the application of physics and engineering principles to understand how living organisms function. All right, so going into my research, the questions that I'm really interested in answering lately are how to move when you have no legs. Um, and so limblessness, these snake-like body plans have evolved over and over and over, more than 25 times an ancestral creature that had legs ended up leading to a species that had no legs. And so when we look at these species, pretty much all of them can move using something called lateral undulation. And so you might think of this as slithering in a snake. So lateral undulation is this sort of side to side motion uh, that's gonna propel the animal forward. And if you think about it, that's not so different from how a lot of fish move. They use a side to side motion to propel themselves. And so lateral undulation is something that we see in basically all of the limbless creatures. But snakes can do way more than that. Um, they've radiated into pretty much every habitat you can think of just about. They live underground, up in the trees, in the ocean, and on all kinds of surfaces. And I am especially interested in how some snakes deal with sandy environments. So if you've ever walked on sand, you know it's way more difficult than solid ground because the sand is shifting around underneath you. And you can imagine that for a snake, its whole body is gonna be hunkered down in that shifting sand. Uh, and so that's probably a big challenge, right? And so something really neat uh, that's evolved to help snakes deal, we think, with sand is this motion called sidewinding. And so here's one of my, my high-speed videos. Uh, so this is slowed down. And you can see how the snake lifts its head up forward and anchors it to the ground. And then it's lifting loops of its body to follow. And so body loops are kind of alternating between being lifted and moving and being anchored to the ground. I'll show that one more time without talking over it. years of studying them and I could still watch sidewinding all day long. All right, so here's kind of a goofy but helpful GIF where you can see these sort of pink highlighted tracks are where the body is stationary on the ground and the lifted parts are moving. And so a sidewinding snake leaves these really distinctive tracks that are super helpful to biologists who wanna study them in the field because that means we can like hike around the desert, look for these distinctive tracks. And when we see them, we know, okay, there's a sidewinder at the other end of that track uh, and we can follow it. And so that is super convenient and helpful. So with respect to the biomechanics of the motion, we know a few things. So we know how sidewinders modify their motion to go up slopes, like a dune, for example. We know how they modify the motion to make a turn or to avoid an obstacle. Of course, those of us in research are really interested in what we don't know, right? What is there left to find out? Uh, and the answer is lots of things. But the things that I'm going to focus on today that I've been working on are, first of all, how does the sidewinding motion scale up from really small snakes, like little babies that sidewind you know, from birth, basically, up to big sidewinders? And also, do different body proportions affect the motion? And so to tackle these questions, uh, I spent a summer out in the desert in Arizona studying sidewinder rattlesnakes. And so 
along with the field crew and some other researchers, uh, I would spend every night out hiking all over the desert, trying to catch as many sidewinders as possible. And we ended up getting a whole bunch, ranging in size from these like teeny tiny eight gram babies that are like this big when they're coiled up on the ground to <laughs> what's monstrous for a sidewinder, like 272 grams. You'll laugh because that's actually a pretty small snake. Sidewinders just aren't that impressive. Um, and so I captured all of these snakes and we temporarily brought them back into a hut that we called a field station uh, and collected data. So I anesthetized the snakes um, and painted these dots on them. So you can see little dots along the body and those are gonna help me track the motion and video data. And I also got measurements of their bodies. So I weighed them, measured how long they are, how long's their tail, stuff like that. Once they woke up uh, and had some time to sort of get over the anesthesia, I put them into this sandbox here and I let them sidewind while I got videos with two cameras. The first was positioned up high to get the sort of overhead view of sidewinding and the other camera is down low, very close to the ground to get sort of this lateral or side view of the motion. And from these videos, I could do 3D motion tracking. So remember those 10 dots I painted on, I could track their 3D coordinates at every point in time as the snake was sidewinding. And from this 3D like sort of point data, I could calculate a bunch of variables. So for example, I know how high is the sidewinder lifting its body. I can look at the wave made by the body and calculate things like the amplitude, the wavelength and the frequency. And I can also look at whole snake speed and acceleration. <clears throat> All right, so, so far I'm seeing a whole lot of variation in both the morphology of the snakes and also in the biomechanics of their motion. The project's still ongoing though, so I'm afraid I can't reveal very much more at this point. Uh, that said, there are probably some ecological consequences to all this variation. So, these differences in the motion could lead to differences in movement pattern and habitat use, right? Like how high you're lifting your body might determine whether you can go over that tiny plant or if you have to go around it. Um, and all this variation is going to provide the raw material for evolution. And like I said before, this diversity of life is really interesting to me. And you don't get diversity unless there is underlying variation in the first place. So speaking of evolution, uh, let's transition now from the biomechanics to more the evolution of sidewinding. I've talked about rattlesnakes so far, but it's not just rattlesnakes, the sidewinder rattlesnakes that are sidewinding. Uh, if we look across the globe, we find that sidewinding vipers have evolved in a bunch of different deserts on several continents. So sidewinding specialists are all across the world living in these sandy deserts. And if we look at the snake family tree, also known as a phylogeny, we see that these sidewinding species are not all closely related to each other. So the sidewinding motion, the specialization for sidewinding has evolved several times independently. Now, at this point, you might be asking, look, maybe all vipers can sidewind and maybe we would see it if we just put them on sand. And so luckily someone has done this, just that. So this team of researchers at Zoo Atlanta and Georgia Tech took a bunch of snakes from the zoo, vipers from the zoo and put them in a sandbox to see what they did. So that's lateral undulation. It looks pretty good. Don't know what to call that, but it doesn't look like it's making great progress. This one, not so great either. This poor guy just doesn't know what the heck is happening and so on and so forth. So despite being on sand, some of these snakes are not using sidewinding, even though it's clearly impossible to make any progress without sidewinding. Okay, so if not all vipers can sidewind, then maybe these sidewinding specialists have some kind of special morphology that helps them do it. Um, and we see this often, we see convergent evolution where animals that move in one way have a particular body shape. So if we look into the ocean, there is one particular shape that is great for swimming really fast, 
And so species as different as dolphins, sharks, tunas, and ichthyosaurs have all evolved basically the same body shape. Um, and so to look at this in vipers, I relied really heavily on museum specimens. Uh, in fact, Cal Academy is one of the places that I came to measure snakes to sort of figure out what is the body shape gonna be like in sidewinders. And so I measured all kinds of traits. Um, and I, one of the things that I looked at was counting their ventral scales. And a cool thing about snakes is that those scales along their belly correspond one to one with the number of vertebra. And so you can get an idea how many vertebrae they have because that varies a lot in snakes. And I had a few predictions about how sidewinding species would be different. So first of all, they might have really wide flat bodies, which would increase the contact with the ground and maybe it could reduce slippage. They might have relatively short tails because if you look at a video of a sidewinding snake closely, you see that the tail is really not doing anything. And so if the tail were long, it would just be like whipping around uselessly and that's but not probably what you want. I also thought that maybe they have more vertebra and that's because more vertebra makes a snake more flexible and flexibility could be important for forming those tight bends uh, in the body that you saw in the videos earlier. And so to look at whether the morphology matters, I did these special types of analyses that there's special statistics to account for the evolutionary relationships basically. And so I use these analyses to compare sidewinding species and non-sidewinding relatives to see if they're different. Uh, and I was really excited to see what the results were. And it turned out there were no differences, which can be really disappointing as a scientist because like we all want to see what are the cool adaptations, right? And in this case, I didn't see any. And there could be a few reasons for that. So first off, maybe the traits I looked at just don't matter for sidewinding. Maybe it's something else, like the muscles or the skeleton or the neural control, like stuff gets nuts once you get into the brain. And Dr. Z will talk more about that later, I think, um, with respect to the gliding snake. So there could be all kinds of important things that are just not what I looked at. Another possibility is that vipers are pre-adapted. And so the idea here is like, well, I thought maybe they'd be wide and flat and have short tails, but those are kind of traits of vipers anyway. Vipers compared to other snakes are wide and flat and have short tails. And so maybe they already have the body shape that's advantageous for sidewinding. And then there's this third idea that's kind of interesting, which is that behavior can evolve more quickly. Oftentimes the morphology does. It's easier to evolve a new behavior. And then once you have that behavior, the morphology will eventually catch up after enough generations of natural selection. And so maybe sidewinding has evolved recently enough that morphology just hasn't had time. Now, I think this last one I can probably rule out, and that's because I did some other projects looking at other morphology and did find some cool things. So when we dug down deeper and look at the muscles, uh, snakes are a big mass of muscles. <laughs> it's a little hard to tell what's going on, but there are certain muscles that run along the trunk on the sides of the body that are important for bending, right? And so they're important for locomotion. And you can measure how long those muscles are. How many vertebra do the muscles span? And when we looked at the length of one of these muscles in a bunch of vipers, uh, we found that three sidewinding specialists we looked at had shorter spinalis muscles than any of the other vipers in our study. And short spinalis muscles would make you more flexible. So going back to this idea earlier about flexibility, so it does look like for the muscle morphology, there is some evolution going on and sidewinding specialists seem to be different. Now we have another cool line of evidence for the morphology where we zoom way in and we look at the scale microstructure and nanostructure. So if you look at a snake's belly, you can see those ventral scales uh, and you can use something like atomic force microscopy to see what the surface looks like on a level that your eye can't pick up. Uh, and so if you look at most snakes, you'll see that the scales have these sort of like finger-like projections on them. And what those projections do is they make the surfic surface, this is a fancy word, anisotropic. What that means is the friction is different depending on the direction. I mean, if you ever cut, cut a cat or a dog like the right way versus the wrong way, you can feel a friction difference. So this is the same thing. 
And so in a slithering snake, uh, you want it to be really easy to slide forward, right? But you don't want to slide back necessarily or like slide off to the sides. Um, and so this sort of anisotropic structure is really helpful. When you look at a couple of sidewinding specialists, though, you see their surface looks really different. So you've got these like little pits and the friction is the same in every direction. Um, and I have to say, every time I look at these, I don't know if anyone else here likes Ethiopian food, but I just can't stop thinking of injera and it makes me super hungry. Uh, but this is what sidewinder scales look like. And so the, the lead author on this project, my colleague Jennifer Reeser, is a physicist, and she was able to do some really nifty mathematical modeling to show that, in theory at least, the structure where the friction is the same in all directions will actually enhance your performance at sidewinding. So it's better to like have the same friction in all ways for sidewinding than to have that like usual snake structure. So that's super cool. We've got some like neat evidence that maybe there's some morphological specialization going on here. Uh, though there are a lot of questions still open. And for my own future work, uh, I'm really interested in integrating the biomechanics and the evolution. So what I've told you about today, I had like some projects that were more biomechanics and some projects that were more evolution. And I'd like to put the two together more fully. And so the study system that I'm currently starting to work in for that uh, is to look at non-specialist species. So like these here are a bunch of water snakes. They're North American water snakes. Uh, and as the name might imply, they do not live in sandy desert environments and they don't specialize in sidewinding. But it turns out that if you toss at least some of them on sand, you get sidewinding to some degree. Um, and so this opens up all kinds of cool opportunities uh, because of the variation, like I said earlier, right? So here we've got variation among species. So some species will sidewind pretty readily. Some are really reluctant and some species just won't sidewind at all, as far as I can tell. And then also like some of them sidewind well and some of them do a pretty crappy approximation. On top of that, there's variation within the species. So if you look at one litter, so like all siblings of baby snakes, some of them might sidewind and some of them might not. So that opens up some really exciting opportunities uh, to look at the evolution of specialization and the sidewinding motion. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. And I want to thank all of you so much for listening and for Cal Academy, both for helping with the research and for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, and I look forward to chatting more later. <laughs> Jess, that was so good. I also really love the implication that you just go around throwing snakes on sand and being like, eh, what you got? <laughs> um, I, know, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fascinating. And um, I also felt really guilty laughing at the bad sidewinders or the snakes that sidewind poorly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that our next guest was super excited about that talk too. And I I totally, I would love to have all of you back because I feel like there's so much more to say about all these subjects and people are super into it. But um, I'll say goodbye to you for the moment and we will bring on Dr. Z. Hey. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, I look like in there we have our little behind the scenes chat and I look like you were super fascinated by some of the intersection between Jess's work and your work. So that's oh, really yeah. cool. <laughs> You're okay, going to awesome. see a lot of parallels. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay. Well, we will give you your slides and I will see you in just a few. Thank you so much. Cool. All right, hi everyone, I'm Dr. Z. Uh, I'm currently working at the Atlas Institute at CU Boulder, but I'm gonna talk about some work that I did at Virginia Tech uh, studying flying snakes. Uh, like I think a very large majority of people who've spoken today, I have become a herpetologist because of Harry Green. <laughs> I also took a herpetology course. Um, he also came up and chatted with me afterward and it was love ever since. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about flying snakes. They're probably one of my favorite animals on the planet and 
I'm sure they're gonna be your favorite as well. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about where they're from, how they move through their environment and how they use vision to do so. Uh, we're definitely gonna see videos of them gliding. Don't worry, it's coming. Uh, but we're going to, I'm particularly interested in how they see. So I'm a neuroengineer. That means I'm really interested in creating the gadgets that help us explore how nervous systems work. And in this case, I use uh, gaming systems and VR to look at how these animals are able to see their environment. Next. Awesome. So this work I did in the Soha lab, um, studying these guys, and they are just really funky and curious and have a huge wealth of visual behaviors, like this head wag that you see here, where it turns to the side and then it does this lateral oscillation of the head, and then it's gonna show its shyness. Okay, bye. <laughs> right, so these guys are very visually dominant, uh, meaning that they use their vision to uh, inform a lot of movement. They're very curious, they look at what you do, they wanna see what's going on, uh, and they track a lot of things in their environment. Next. Okay, so I got really into snake vision because they have this really funky evolutionary history. Snakes were fossorial for 75 million years. And during that time, they basically evolved away eyes. They had a rudimentary lens, they had a rudimentary retina, and that was about it. The spectacle to keep everything safe, uh, but very, very, very reduced. When they came above ground, they became terrestrial and, and more so <laughs> terrestrial, aquatic, arboreal, and in the case of flying snakes, sometimes aerial, they re-evolved eyes and with it, a lot of the structures that help them see. For example, they re-evolved the ectodermal conus, which is how the retina, which is where all the photoreceptors are, get all the blood. Uh, they re-evolved the shape of their lens and they re-evolved all the musculature around it, which we call the iris. And then there's a couple more uh, bodies there, but we'll just keep it simple for now. Uh, next. So one thing that's really fascinating is if you compare snake eyes, which we see on the right, to um, reptiles that didn't have a fossorial period and didn't lose their eyes and re-evolve it, they have a couple of different solutions. For one, they don't have fovea for the most part. We only know of four species of snakes that have fovea. The other thing that's interesting is that they don't adjust the focus of their vision on the retina by changing the shape of the lens. This is what geckos do. This is what we do to some extent. Instead, they move the lens forward and back, as you see on the right-hand side on the bottom. So there's all these different evolutionary solutions that came up, and that really led me to wonder, how does snake vision differ from other reptiles? And of course, they're flying snakes. So if I had the opportunity to study vision in snakes, it's gotta be the coolest snake around, right? Uh, next. Excellent. So these um, flying snakes belong to the genus Chrysopelia. There are five species in this genus and they're all found in the Malay archipelago. That means that they're pretty much running from the southern tip of India and China all the way down to the Philippines. So I study Chrysopelia paradisi, the paradise tree snake. It's one of the five, and of the five snakes that all glide or at least jump, it has the best gliding uh, performance. These guys are mildly venomous and they're epistoglyphs, which means that they're rear fanged, so it's really hard for them to envenomate you. They're also really tiny. Their heads are about the size of my pinky. They are in the middle of the food chain, which means they spend about as much time running away from predators as they run toward prey. Uh, and they live in cavities uh, in the middle of the canopy. So they go from pretty dark areas at night, they're diurnal animals, to very bright areas in the day. And in the day, they spend most of their time in the canopy of what's called a dipterocarp forest. Dipterocarps are a particular type of tree that are extremely tall. They're like 40 meters tall on average. They're gigantic. And they're much, much bigger than the other trees that are in the canopy. So they stick out several meters above the rest of the canopy, which creates this sparse canopy that you see on the right. All of this sparseness 
um, evolutionary scientists believe uh, led to this convergent evolution of gliding flight. So every gliding animal that you could possibly think of pretty much lives in this forest. There's flying squirrels, there's a flying primate called a colugo, uh, there's racoporids, which are the flying frogs, uh, there's uh, tychozoans, which are the flying geckos, there's flying lizards, which is draco, genus draco, uh, and there's a number of arboreal snakes and including vine snakes. So everything in this um, uh, forest is deeply arboreal and there's lots and lots and lots of instances of evolution of gliding, which is pretty cool. What's really fascinating about their particular environment and where they live uh, and how they live is if we look at the areas that are, are highlighted there in that box, those three things, where you are in the food chain, where you spend your time during the day, and features of your environment are all known to affect the evolution of vision visual systems. So there's a lot of clues here that lead to a very unique, uh, suggest a very unique uh, visual system. Next. All right, so how do these guys do what they do? So first off, I just wanna make a point of clarification that even though they're gliders, they are flyers. Gliding is a form of flight, it's just not powered, meaning they don't flap uh, or produce uh, uh, generating forces of lift, but they do engage in behaviors that maximize their lift to drag ratio. And the way they do this is by having a very distinct morphology. They'll articulate their ribs similar to how a cobra opens up its hood. So if we look uh, next, if we look at these images on the top, we see the uh, flying snake on the left. First, it's uh, just relaxed with the ribs compressed down. And on the right, they'll expand their ribs, not just out, but forward as well along the vertebra. And if we look at what the cobra is doing on the bottom, we see a very similar kind of uh, expansion of the ribs where they move out and then forward. And by doing this, they're able to achieve a, a pretty high, what we call a glide ratio, which means they have a one-to-one -one ratio. So for as high up as they are, that's about as far out as they can go. They perform about a third as well, a third as well as uh, flying squirrels who have these really big patagium to catch air and are excellent gliders. So they're comparable to some of the best gliders around and they don't have limbs. It's really fascinating. Next. Not only do they flatten along one portion of their body, like the uh, cobras, they actually flatten along the entire length of their body from the neck down to the vent. Uh, next pop up and take a look here. Um, so they actually flatten themselves along the entire body so much so that their heart pops out, uh, which you see in uh, indicated by the gray arrows. Next. And if we look at how their, their posture is during flight, you can see that the, the flattening starts immediately behind the head and goes all the way to the tail, uh, which is, uh, they actually have a rather long tail. Um, and the cross section of the, the body when they flatten out creates this airfoil shape, which again, helps increase their lift to drag ratio. So they're able to engage in these highly aerodynamically conservative uh, um, uh, positions by changing the, the overall shape of their body and by changing how they undulate in the air as they glide. Next. So let's take a look of uh, how they actually do that. So there's five steps to a glide. They'll go into a J loop, which you see there, and then launch themselves into the air. As they launch, they flatten their bodies out, go into ballistic dive, which you see here. And in most cases, when they glide after the ballistic dive, they'll go into a glide. Sometimes they just dive because they just want to get away from you. And sometimes they'll actually establish themselves into a glide. What's interesting is when they actually glide, which we'll see here, a, a nice sustained glide, they'll actually move very similar to how sidewinders move in the ground, where they pick up the bends of their um, body out of the plane of the body. So similar to how sidewinds lift up the curves of their uh, bodies as they move, flying snakes do a similar thing in the air, and we're still exploring what that does for them aerodynamically. Next. So obviously, if you're gliding, if you're flying, like most animals, vision is going to play a huge 
roll. So these guys spend a generous amount of time peering before they take off. They're probably looking for options, threats, maybe landing sites, and they're highly visual animals in general. When they hunt, they're sensitive to movement, particularly acceleration. And when they're being hunted, they are very keenly aware of what's going on around them, particularly overhead. Uh, and they'll track objects like planes and hawks as they fly overhead, as you see on the right. So seeing all of these behaviors and seeing how complex their glided flights are, I was really curious about what flying snakes are able to see and what their visually guided behaviors actually are. I'm also really interested in how they actually control these movements using their vision, but I'm not gonna have the time to get into that in this talk. Next. All right, let's get into the science. So I started out, these guys are very, very rare <laughs> in terms of science and sort of research. So we don't really know very much about them. So I had to start from square one, just figuring out what they're able to see. And to do this, I built something called an optic kinetic drum, which you see on the right. And when we move this drum in a particular way, this rotational movement, it generates a visual reflex called optic kinetic nystagmus. So I'm going to play this video on the right hand side. And I just want to give a little word of caution that it's going to be uh, a little dizzying. So if it bothers you, I'll give you a heads up. You just close your eyes. I'll give you a heads up when the video stops playing. So go ahead and hit play. And so what we'll see here is the rotation will start going from uh, right to left. And I want you to watch the head of the snake as it goes. It has this very slow tracking. And if you watch the tip of the nose, you're going to see a little tick and a tick. There's one and tick and a tick. So all of those, and you can pause that video now. So all of those little ticks are evidence of this visual reflex. Um, next. Yeah, so if we look at the position of the head over time, we can see that there's a slow phase, which we see in gray, and then the fast phase, which is that little tick that you see. And if we track this slow phase and we see how it compares to the rotation of the drum, we get a measure called gain. So ideally, we want to see the head moving at the same speed as the rotation of the drum. And we call that a gain of one. If the head moves faster than the drum is moving, that's a gain of greater than one. And if a head moves slower than the drum is moving, that's a gain of less than one. So we can use this reflex and measure it as we change the stimulus that it sees. So how fast the stimulus is moving, how how big those grains, the grates are, the vertical grates are, and then we can get an assessment of what they're able to see, at least behaviorally. Uh, next, please. Thanks. All right, so we're going to look at two major features here. Spatial acuity, which you can think of as like the resolution of your screen or resolution of a photo. The more pixels you have, the better resolution you have. The more photoreceptors you have, the better resolution you have. These are measured in cycles per degree, so the number of repeating patterns that fit in a degree of your field of vision. To give you a sense of scale, if you take your thumb and stick it out at, at arm's distance, that's about three degrees of your field of vision. Then we're going to look at temporal acuity, which is similar to thinking of the refresh rate of the screen. And we measure this in units of hertz. The higher the number, the faster the visual system can process. So if you have like a gaming monitor, those will have refresh rates of about 120 hertz. And a standard monitor or your phone will have a refresh rate of about 60 or 70 hertz. Okay, so the higher you have a refresh rate, the faster you can process things that are going on. You get less blur, you get more crisp uh, vision. Next. All right, so let's look at the data. If it's very confusing, great, because it is. So we can look at the stimulus as it goes from something easy on the left-hand side of the x-axis to something hard on the right-hand side. So we're going from a fine grate to, sorry, a, a broad grate to something finer on the right-hand side. And the same thing in the vertical axis. So we're trying different uh, grates that we're looking at. These animals were able to move freely. And so distance, the viewing distance, how close 
closest they are or far away they are from the stimulus is also going to affect their spatial acuity. So that's why we have this gradient on the X axis. And what we had hoped to see is are these really nice arcs and really big curves like we see in the orange trace in that bottom graph, but we didn't really see that. And I literally spent about a year and a half staring at this exact figure going, what the heck is going on? Uh, the same thing happens in temporal acuity. Next where again, we didn't see these nice fall offs like we see in this orange trace. We're starting to see these very broad, flat curves. And for a really long time, this just confounded me until I thought about where they live and how they operate in the day. Next. All right, so these guys have very low, uh, can respond to very low levels of light. Uh, next, I think we're missing a little graphic here. Bam. All right. So they respond. We start to see visual response to movement at about 11 lux, which is equivalent to dusk or dawn. So pretty dark for a diurnal snake that doesn't have eyelids or the ability to contract its irises. So what I realized once we looked at all of the data together is what we're seeing is actually a very dynamic and adaptive visual system. Next. So these guys all together, just keep going, just hit it till we see everything on screen. All right. So we didn't see these nice clean curves that we wanted to see. We see these very broad curves, which means that they're not really tuning or, or evolved for one particular type of behavior. So we're looking at in this data, the average of looking at a stimulus for about three or four minutes on uh, overall. So we're looking at them as their visual system is adjusting to these very dynamic uh, inputs. And we talked to a couple of ophthalmologists and we actually did a, an eye exam on these snakes, which is hilarious because they're so tiny, uh, but their pupils don't really dilate, but they can move their lenses back and forth. So they are, their visual system is therefore needs to have some sort of adaptation. The system itself has to change the range of sensitivity based on the amount of brightness that we see or the amount of difficulty, how fast things are moving, how finely things are moving in the environment around them. It's a really phenomenal system. Next. I was also interested in not just how they're able to see, but what they're able to see. And I wanted to explore their field of vision. Typically when we do these kinds of experiments, it's really invasive. We have to put an electrode in the eye. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the animal if you wanna see where they're recording or you have to sacrifice the eye. There are some modern techniques that get around that, but generally it's pretty hard to do. So instead we decided to go for something called uh, inverse perimetry. First, we scan their heads, which you see on the right. Next. From these scanned images, we made a 3D model, which you see here. I made this in uh, a number of different applications, but I used it primarily in Unity 3D, which is used to make uh, video games. Next. Then we shot virtual lasers at the head. So where you're seeing that conversion of those two yellow lines is a point that rotated all the way around the head on this sphere that you see in tan. And it shot a laser as it rotated. So it kind of does this as it moves around. So it has a range of, of projections. And then from this, we can back calculate what their worldview is. Next. All right, so here's what we got. Everything that you're seeing on the left-hand side with all of those dots is their full spherical field of view with red indicating binocularity, black indicating blindness, and there's a little blue triangle that shows you where their snout is in all of this. And if we look at a slice through either horizontally or vertically, we can see that they have a fairly decent range of binocularity. In females, we see about 23 degrees of binocularity. In males who have smaller heads, Heads are much, much smaller. They have 44 degrees of binocularity. Compared to humans, we have about 120 degrees of binocularity, and we see about 180 degrees on the sides of us. These guys do way better than us in terms of field of view. They can see 230 degrees around their heads, so almost entirely around their heads. And if we look vertically, they tend to have this slight bias to an upward gaze, which probably helps them spot predators, especially with the females that are bigger and not as good flyers. Uh, next. Great. Uh, so they also do this head wag, which is a behaviorally dynamic um, movement. So they do this um, when they're going to cross gaps or jump. 
uh, to use to induce motion parallax, which is a way for them to gauge distance. They also do this in the optokinetic drum where it's very difficult for them to gauge uh, distance. Rotational uh, motion doesn't actually allow you to, to decipher distance very well. Um, and so what we saw is that when they're using this to, to gauge distance when they're doing gap crossing, they'll oscillate their heads at about two hertz. But when they're doing it uh, in the optomotor drum, it's much slower, about 0.2 hertz. So what we think we're seeing here is a very dynamic uh, visually guided behavior, where in one case they use it to gauge distance, and in another they're using it to visually camouflage. If you're trying to hide from prey and everything around you is moving and you're not, you're going to stick out. But if you start to move with the scenario, now you start to blend in. Next. All right. The next thing that I did was see how I wanted to look at how they control their vision and I did this using virtual reality. So I built a huge arena that placed and placed them in it on this table that's basically like a beefed up air hockey table to reduce friction. And then I put a tracker on their head. That's what that T is. You can go ahead and play that video again. Um, and as they're moving around, that position of their head is going to update the visual field, which you can see in the top right corner. And when it turns in particular, it adjusts. And then it does this nystagmus, and it holds the video steady. So it's rotating and rotating and rotating until they do nystagmus, and then it holds it steady. Next. Hopefully something will pop up, maybe not. Oh, well. Um, so what we saw in that, uh, it's just the layering of that slide didn't work very well. But what we saw in that uh, image was that uh, they're able to hold, as they do this nystagmus, as they're rotating their head at the same speed as the perceived rotation, they're trying to hold that image in place so they can get as much information about the visual scene as possible. So let's recap what we've learned about these guys. They're so, so cool. So first of all, you can just keep start clicking, go for it. <laughs> um, so these guys have very strong visual behaviors. First off, they track overhead. Uh, so they'll track planes, they'll track uh, hawks, which is keeping track of predators. They head wag, which is this very dynamic behavior that they use to gauge distance and also to camouflage. And they have this optokinetic nystagmus, which is this highly conserved reflex that lets us figure out what they're able to see. They have a visual field that's adapted for predatory vision, where they have that nice sizable uh, binocularity and prey vision, which allows you to see a very large sweep behind the head. They're very sensitive to low light, probably because they're cavity dwellers, but they also have a very dynamic and highly adaptive visual system, which allows them to go from these dark cavities to bright canopies without contracting their irises. And finally, using VR, we're able to see that they're, they do respond to digital stimuli and they're able to control their visual scene by using what we call a closed loop where their position of their head can feed back to the visual scene and they can actually control where they're going. And with that, I'd like to thank you next all for your attention. Thanks to the Cal Academy of Sciences for inviting me tonight. Particular thanks to the Soha Lab at Virginia Tech. Uh, Jake Soha provided all of the images in this talk. He's a phenomenal photographer and an excellent advisor. Uh, Nicole Araujo was an undergrad that worked with me. Uh, Michelle Graham worked with the head wagging work and Talia Weiss did a lot of work with uh, a lot of the coding that we were doing and, and tracking in the VR system. Uh, special shouts to Bruce Jane, who's just a really great uh, a collaborator and conspirator. <laughs> uh, and thanks to NSF for funding. Thank you all. That was incredible. This is like a trio of mind blowing presentations. Um, let's bring everybody back on, please, Christina. And um, you may have already noticed this in comments, the three of you, but Harry Green has appeared to tell you all that these were amazing talks. And he <laughs> asked a question that I will save for our grand finale question. Um, but first, we have a handful from uh, viewers. So I grabbed a couple for each of you. Um, and I'll just go in the order that you spoke. So, uh, Ariana, for you, we have a question from Aaron, who I suspect is a younger person who would like to know, if I see a snake in the wild, what should I do? Oh, and you're muted. 
Let me unmute. So if you see a snake in the wild, um, A, that's fantastic. You've spotted one. That's my favorite thing that can happen to me. And I know that a lot of people, their main concern is spotting a snake in the wild and the snake potentially being venomous. Now, if you live in an area, A, it's best to know if there are venomous species that occur there. And if you can't ID the snake from a safe distance, then you should leave it alone. Um, but if you have gotten really good at identifying the animals in your habitat, I love to grab the snake and check it out up close. But um, you know, these are also animals that are great to observe in their natural habitat, moving around and doing their own thing from, from a safe distance. Okay, uh, there are safe ways to pick up um, snakes that are not venomous. And then if they are, leave that to professionals. <laughs> Well, that actually ties nicely to this other question I'll tack on from Liz, which is how do the professionals actually catch snakes for study? Um, so for me, my hands. Um, so I spend the entire field season kind of looking under every possible rock and log that I can find during the day. So you just flip rock after rock. And I tell everyone, you know, you miss 100% of the snakes that are under rocks that you didn't flip. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that we do is we go out at night with headlamps. And so the nocturnal species will be out hunting. And so then you might spot them due to contrast. So that bumblebee snake that I showed before, um, its pattern will really stand out at night if you had your headlamp on it. Sometimes you find them when they're sleeping in the tree at night and you kind of surprise them. Uh, that's one other way. And then lastly, if it were a venomous species, there is special equipment and safe ways to actually handle these snakes for people that are studying them. And I'm sure Jessica is much more aware of this than I am. <laughs> Um, so that's what I do when I find snakes in the wild, but the main one is my hands. There's almost nothing else that I'm using because on Madagascar, there's no lethally venomous species. So I am safe to grab whatever I spot going on. Okay. Or to fall on it, alternately. Or to fall on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was helpful. Um, so Jess or Jessica, um, from Andrew, uh, is there any current consensus on whether the common ancestor of snakes was burrowing or aquatic based on their biomechanics? Oh, uh, okay. There are a lot of papers on this, and there was a big argument for a while. I'm sure Shaz is laughing, has also read some of these. Um, my understanding, Shaz might want to jump in too, uh, but my understanding is that burrowing seems like the more plausible reason for a few reasons. Um, and I know at some point, I think I saw a paper where somebody was arguing that, like, if you look really closely at their eyes, it seems like an aquatic eye. But I, Again, Shaz knows this stuff better than I do for sure, but I'm under the impression that burrowing is more plausible ancestor. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm inclined to agree with that as well. Um, with the eye convergence, how the eyes look like they're aquatic, uh, they have to solve a lot of the same problems when you're underground as when you're underwater. Um, so there's a, there's not, it's not just the, the, the evolutionary pressure is very similar. Um, and then how they lost their legs. So remember, they did have limbs a long time ago, but they lost their forelimbs first and their back limbs uh, last, which also uh, supports the theory that they were um, fossorial, they were burrowing. Oh, cool. Right. Okay. That's super interesting. Um, Shaz, for you from Shay, I was going to be surprised if we didn't get this, but can you explain a little bit more about the heart popping out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's man. just so when you think about the heart, it, uh, your ribs, it really is there to protect a number of things, but among them, your heart. Um, and so as the ribs come out and then move forward, right, you now, if you think about how that happens on your chest, there's there's nowhere to go. And a lot of the other organs are quite malleable. So the lungs in a snake are very long and tubular. Um, uh, the gut, the stomach are very long. Everything's very long and tubular, but the heart is not. The heart is very circular. And so as the, or spherical. So as the uh, ribs are coming forward, it just pushes the heart forward uh, and exposes it. And I, I imagine it's, it's, quite vulnerable in that way, but there's not a lot that comes up <laughs> you know, right. to get them while they're flying, fortunately. That's yeah. wild. Um, okay, thank you. We'll loop back to uh, Ariana from Jamie. Of all the different group reptile groups in Madagascar, um, which one shows the most total diversity? Most total diversity. Um, so kind of depends how you <laughs> want to it down. If you want to just focus on gaconids or all reptiles versus all amphibians um, versus like things like all the snakes. Um, the most total diversity. I mean, so we know that now if you add in all of the lineages that we found in, in my study that I've done with my colleagues, there's as many as 130 gem snakes. And they aren't the only snakes on the island, but all the other groups have like, you know, there's 
few blind snakes. There's a tiny bit of boas. Bipyrids are not there. Something happened, so they never showed up, um, or they went extinct when they got there. And so this is a really diverse group. But you know, there are a ton of chameleons. There's a lot of microendemism, so species that occur in these really tiny ranges, and they're not found anywhere else. Um, and then there's other species that kind of span all these different habitats. So um, there's tons of micro chameleons and giant chameleons. This is a very diver diverse group on the island. Um, there's quite a few geckos as well. You know, some people had commented I saw on the leaf-tailed geckos. So this is a prominent group there. But also, if you guys are familiar with the geico gecko, this is actually a felsuma, and that is a <laughs> A whole group of species. There's not just one. There's a ton, and so they're very diverse in the island as well. So awesome. Quite a few groups. Mm -hmm. So cool. Okay, thank you, um, Jessica from Gale. So not all vipers sidewind, but do all desert snakes do all? Oh, sorry. So not all vipers sidewind, but do all desert snakes do it? It seems so efficient. Uh, it is efficient, and no, not all desert snakes do it. So this is one of the cool things we see that seems to me like it is tied to body shape, even though I didn't get any of those body shape effects. So if you look at some of the really slender species that live in deserts, like shovel nose snakes or glossy snakes, and most of these species have sort of convergent counterparts um, outside of North America. So if you look at the slender species, many of them can use lateral undulation and they get along quite well. Uh, but if you think about it, if you're like long and skinny, you can like throw out sort of these big loops and it, you know, goes kind of nicely. But if you're this sort of short, stout hyper, your lateral undulation is going to look kind of different. Um, not to mention you're just like heavier and you're shoving more sand around. Uh, and so I think that most likely it's not that lateral undulation doesn't work on sand, period. We know that it can. I think it's that lateral undulation doesn't work if you have a certain body type. And right. so it's those like heavy vipers that have to evolve sidewinding if they're going to live in the sand. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and Shaz, do you know from Finn, can flying snakes change directions once they launch or are they pretty committed at that point? Yeah, good question. Yes, they can. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, they can turn in the air. Uh, there is, if you search on YouTube, there's a Nat Geo uh, video where you see it launches and then makes a really, one of the snakes makes a really sharp turn. Whoa. It's pretty dramatic, yeah, but they can oh, turn. Oh, mm -hmm. oh crazy. Um, yeah. I'll throw this one as well from Jason. Is the optokinetic drum something often used to test vision or did you create it? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Um, so it was used uh, in like the 70s and 80s when a lot of the behavioral, um, like comparative behaviors uh, experiments kind of happened um, in in uh, excess. <laughs> um, but it's since fallen off. A lot of uh, the visual organisms that we study, everyone kind of knows what they can do already. Uh, so it doesn't really come up that often. So I had to actually design it from scratch because the papers were so old that the the, the tools that they use and the methods that they use don't really apply to today. Um, so you can actually read all about that in uh, my paper that came out last October in uh, Journal of Integrative and Comparative Biology. Oh, cool. But okay. Had to, had to design it from scratch. Um, that's really, really neat. I think this is a good time for uh, Harry's final question, which is pretty good. And for each of you, that is, um, if resources were no problem, what would you most like to do next, Ariana? So um, I have thought about this before. And if resources were not a problem, I would go to Madagascar and I would sequence the entire genome with all the bajillion base pairs that are in it for every single snake species that's there. <laughs> I would have, and I already actually do have a handful of whole genome sequences for snakes, which is something I couldn't have even envisioned about 10 years ago, but I would go and I would get it for every single one at the highest possible coverage. <laughs> this would be an enormous amount of funding. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, maybe Harry will, maybe Harry will make that happen. Um, Jessica, for you. Uh, uh, this is a fun question. I should think more about this, but I'm I'm really into like what animals are doing in their real lives in the field. Uh, and biomechanics often requires this equipment that's hard to take into the field, but like technological advances are starting to allow more and more. So one thing that I would love would be to have the resources to collect some of this cool high-tech biomechanics data, but on free living snakes. So like put these data loggers onto free living snakes that, you know, are small enough somehow and still have like 
a way of tracking GPS coordinates and have like an accelerometer so we know when they're sidewinding and like exactly how they're doing it and what times of day, where are they going? Uh, how warm are they? Stuff like that. And the species I would really want to check out, there are these two species pairs, one in Northern Africa, one in Southern Africa. So in the Sahara, there are two species that are closely related. Sarasi sarasis and sarasis vipera. One of them looks a lot like our sidewinder rattlesnake that you saw videos of. The other one looks like a sock puppet. It's got like eyes on top of its head oh, yeah. so that it can like bury, like they, they're, I love them. So they can bury under the sand and like just their eyes are sticking out. Um, and so like this snake is clearly way more of a dune specialist. And then in Southern Africa, you've got these snakes in the genus Vitus that are like not at all closely related to Serastes. But again, you've got one with like horns on its eyes that looks like our sidewinder. And then you've got one that looks like a sock puppet <laughs> that is like way more dune specialized. So um, like what's going on like these yeah. like two <laughs> pairs, it's, it's not just sidewinding. It's like, there's something cool going on there. And if I could like get the data loggers on all these free living snakes and see what they're doing with their lives, I think that would be my next step unlimited resources. Yeah. Oh man, we should just start a Kickstarter for that. That's like so <laughs> all the mystery of the sock puppet pairs. Um and Dr. Z, what about you? Yeah, so definitely seconding uh, Jess's uh, statement there, for sure want to see what flying snakes are doing in the wild. We have no idea why they glide. Uh, I've gotten into very long heated arguments with Jake about what kinds of glides that we see. We think, mm -hmm. I think that we're triggering escape glides, which are different from mm -hmm destination glides because they can really go far if they want to, but we just don't see that very often. So no resource or no limit on resources. What I would love to do is take my VR system and put it in a giant black box theater and get them to glide in VR. Um, that would Crazy. be like, it's, it's really what I set out to do. <laughs> uh, and it turns out it's exceedingly difficult for one person to do that. <laughs> um, but if I could, if I could have like a team of folks and, and about really a year of just development time, I would 100% make an immersive gliding VR arena for snakes. Oh God, that has to happen. We can get probably get some volunteers anyways for the grunt work. <laughs> Um, that's incredible. This has all been incredible, genuinely. And seriously, would love to have all of you back for longer talks. Um, but thank you for giving us your, um, I don't know what night, Wednesday evening. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and for closing out Snake Patrick's Day in the best way possible. Uh, thank you. And thank you viewers who tuned in. Uh, we'll say goodnight for now, but hope to see you again on our program soon. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.